welcome to the final recitation. Uh, and we're going to do the final exam review. So it's going to be mostly similar to the midterm exam review, but customized for the final exam. So again, we're going to go all over the location, day, time, and then the final exam material, format, and tips. Um, we will also review uh, last year's exam, uh, uh, I believe, um, after we're done with the slides. So um, final exam will be next Monday, 15th, May 15th, from 3.30 to 6.30, so three hours exam. Uh, the location will be the same as lecture room, uh, but please double check in your uh, my help. Uh, and also keep an eye on the discourse forum for uh, exam announcements. Uh, the procedure will be similar to the midterm. There will be seating charts and uh, it will be almost similar to the uh, midterm uh, procedure. So final exam material, I've divided that into midterm topics. We have post midterm topics and then we also have papers and some additional uh, topics that uh, you've discussed in the class. So going again, uh, quickly over the midterm topics uh, that you covered. Uh, so starting with the process abstraction and um, you learned that process organize information about other abstractions and it is not tied to a hardware component. Um, we use process abstraction to separate policy, the what, from mechanism, the how. Uh, and um, why do we use abstraction is to just like hide undesirable uh, properties, uh, provide or add uh, new features and organize information. Um, you also should now have a clear view that the threads uh, abstract CPU, address space abstract uh, the memory and the files abstract the disks. Um, We've also presented you with the process model that a process have, could have one or more threads. Uh, it could have, it also has an address space and a file table that is a private to it. Um, we've also said that there is a file handle uh, or file system uh, is divided into three levels. You have the uh, file table that is a private to the uh, process and it has references to the file handles. File handles are also private to process, but once you start working, it will be shared between the parent and child, and then you have the file objects that are shared system-wide. Um, and file handles have a reference to the file objects, and file objects map to blocks on disk. Uh, we've also presented you with file syscalls, uh, process syscalls, you should have now a good after completing the programming assignment, you should have a good idea what and uh, what each of these uh, process uh, and file syscalls does. Um, also, um, we then uh, discussed synchronization, and um, you should by now know what is a critical section. Uh, why do we need to protect a critical uh, critical section, and how do we protect it? So uh, you've been presented with various uh, and also implemented various synchronization primitives, uh, sleep locks, uh, condition variables, uh, reader writer locks. Uh, so you should have a good understanding of these, um, how to implement them. Um, you should also have an idea of deadlocks, starvation, race conditions, what are the definition of each one of these and the differences, how should you avoid them um, also, you should have a good idea about some synchronization problems in case you're being asked about them, uh, so you won't uh, uh, waste time uh, just like uh, figuring out what is that problem. Um, then we moved into the interrupt and exception handling. Uh, so for interrupt exception handling, you should uh, know the types of interrupts uh, and you should know how to differentiate between an interrupt and an exception. Um, how should we handle an interrupt? And uh, you've also discussed the context uh, switching. Uh, you should have a good idea of the process of uh, context switch. Uh, 
Uh, for scheduling, um, you should know why we need scheduling, which is we need it for C multiplexing CPU. And uh, you should have a good idea of the thread states and the transition for, uh, of, from one state to another. What does it mean? Um, also, you should have a good idea about uh, scheduling algorithms, uh, round robin, MLFQ, RSDL. You should be able to compare them, improve them, um, talk about advantages, disadvantages of each one of them. Um, then we've moved into the memory management, and that's where we discuss the virtual and physical addresses. So you should know the process of uh, translating virtual to physical addresses, um, how we divide up the virtual address, how we do retrieve the uh, physical address for a given uh, virtual address, what is a page table, uh, what is a core map, what does the core map keep tracks of, what does the page table keep the track of, uh, well, why do we need them. Uh, um, also, uh, the different implementation that we've discussed for page tables, uh, flat array, linked list, multi-level arrays, uh, you should know uh, how are these implemented and advantages, disadvantages of each one of them. Um, also then we moved into the TLB. Uh, we've said that TLB is uh, used by the MMU that is part of the uh, CPU to speed up the virtual to physical address translation. Um, um, also memory faults, uh, page fault, TLB fault, the difference between each one of them, and uh, which one triggers the other. So TLB fault doesn't necessarily trigger a page fault, but a page fault should, must be preceded by a TLB fault. Um, then we discussed swapping. Uh, also, we've discussed some algorithms on how we can choose uh, the page that we need to evict or swap out. Uh, so you should have a good idea of these algorithms and um, advantages, disadvantages of each. This is the midterm topics uh, that we covered. Then we moved into post midterm topics. Uh, we discussed disks and so you should know what is an HDD, SSD, um, the pros and cons for each one of them. Um, um, the parts of the H, uh, HDD, uh, you should know these parts, um, advantages, disadvantages of each one of them. Then we moved into files. Um, what is a file? What do we expect from a file? And uh, file structure. Uh, you should have an idea of all of this. For example, uh, where should we store, how should we store the metadata about a file? Um, so you have different ways for that. You should know all of uh, these ways, advantages, disadvantages, you should be able to compare them, improve them. Um, file systems, uh, then we moved into the file systems. So um, you should know the expectation of a file system. Why do we need a file system? What are the design goals for a file system? Um, and what are the data structures that are presented? So we presented several data structures to organize uh, data blocks. You should know these. Uh, algorithms uh, and should be able to compare them. Um, caching, consistency. Um, caching and consistency, we've discussed buffer cache. We should know what is a buffer cache and uh, where should we put buffer cache and why. Uh, there are several scenarios for that, so you should be able to compare each one of them. And then we moved into discussing journaling file systems. So you should know what is a journaling, uh, uh, what does a journaling mean, and uh, how does a journaling file system works uh, in different scenarios when there is a crash, and how does it recover. Um, we've also discussed the uh, Berkeley fast file system, uh, and also log structured file system. So for each of these, you should know, you should have an idea, how does it work, and advantages, disadvantages. And several other topics, uh, subtopics that are, uh, I couldn't cover everything here, but you should go over uh, these uh, slides uh, since the final exam is cumulative. So everything discussed from day one up until uh, 
the last day of the class is, is uh, included in the final. Um, so then uh, we uh, also presented you with some papers and some additional topics. Um, so for the RAID paper, uh, you should have a good understanding what is RAID, different kinds, uh, different types of RAID, and you should be able to compare them. Um, uh, then we moved into discussing virtualization, uh, full virtualization, per virtualization, container virtualization. Uh, so again, all of these you should have a good idea about and um, uh, you should be able to compare them. So to what extent you should know, to the extent that's being discussed in the class. Um, um, uh, then we moved into performance and benchmarking. Um, also, we've discussed Amdahl's law and then uh, the paper, hence for computer system design. So uh, these are the topics that have been covered throughout the semester. Um, there are some stuff that you really shouldn't miss. Uh, for example, um, uh, page table translation, questions about page table, how to translate addresses, you should know if this, is, if this comes into the exam, you should know how to do that. You shouldn't really lose points on these uh, such questions. Um, RAID types, make sure you don't miss these. Uh, also, hence for computer system design, uh, make sure you understand uh, and uh, know a couple of them. You should be able to compare them. Um, discuss them. Um, so uh, these are some stuff that you shouldn't, for example, uh, miss. Also the uh, HDD parts, uh, the disk part, uh, don't uh, miss out on this stuff. If a question comes with a figure, we did have uh, a question come that in previous exams uh, with a figure of the uh, uh, disk and ask you, asking you about uh, uh, parts of the disk. So you shouldn't really miss points on such questions. Um, so any questions on the material uh, covered throughout the semester? Okay, call any, any point, anything? Well, I guess you covered a lot of the material. What I'm trying to do is kind of also bounce through some of those bullet points that we were talking about. So just uh, Possibly, maybe just go back to what the other one on this. Uh, yeah, like was it like one of three? Oh, okay. The other bullet on this too. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, this is an inconspicuous one. This is already said on there. A couple of things that you probably should expect from a shorter question, like a shorter answer question, to go on purpose. It's probably a little bit more to the last half of the class on this. Than I have not seen oh, God. Sorry. people are hearing, but the people out in video land are not hearing on this. So as I was just mentioning on this, uh, Ali's list up there is, as he had mentioned, it doesn't cover every last tale on this, but what I would say is in terms of exam preparation, obviously you want to make sure that you are familiar with the specifics. Uh, those are going to show up in some of the short answer questions on this. Uh, I would expect that the short answer questions are going to, as with the essays, disproportionately weight the last part of the course, but again, everything from January on is fair game on this. In terms of like what is on the short answer questions, I don't want to say it's a no order you don't, but it's the sort of thing like what Ali, what Ali was saying, like keep track of, you don't want to make sure like, like a virtual address is not the same thing as a physical address, yada yada on that. Besides that, a couple comments with respect to the essay questions. I assume that Jeff is going to be addressing this in much more detail in tomorrow's wrap-up class, but he is fond of designing at least one or two of the, especially like the 25-point questions, to try to cover lots of topics all at once on this. Like if you look at last year's exam, which we'll be kind of paging through as an example in a couple minutes, there was one question, the 20 point question, which was kind of on one specific area, obviously virtualization, but then the other two questions really did cut a wide swath across the entire course. And that's something that he's actually gonna be expecting. So it's not like, well, what should I study? Should I study, hmm, maybe scheduling? Because is there going to be an 
an essay question on scheduling. There conceivably could be. I'm just saying if you look at the format of these essay questions in the past, it's probably going to be an essay question that will involve scheduling, but it will also involve other subsystems too. So you need to kind of know how the subsystems interplay on this. So if this makes sense, just it's not going to be like one particular question on this or that or what have you. It's, well, it's going to be a combination of them at all. So I was going to kind of dive into, again, last year's exam on this, but before we go on, possible questions about, like in particular, some of the lessons that I had caught, uh, covered on this, but in terms of like who knows processes, synchronization, well, who knows? Uh, interrupts, remember the kernel, everything begins with an interrupt on that. We talked about you people designed a process subsystem and kind of had an interfere, if you will, uh, tie in with a threading subsystem. Again, you should have a good idea on what's the difference between a thread and a process on that. Uh, in terms of scheduling, scheduling, again, Ali had mentioned the various types of schedulers on here. I would be, remember, take a clue from the midterm in terms of how Jeff asked this, that uh, yes, you need to be familiar with a particular type of scheduler, but then, well, maybe go a little bit beyond that. What's a weakness in the scheduler and how can we possibly address that weakness? That's more going to be what the grading staff is going to be looking for. Uh, in terms of paging, swapping, the whole like memory management system, questions about that? Anything else on this? Okay, going once, going twice, sold to the person, what have you. And then maybe next one, uh, disks, in terms of disks, files, again, this is post midterm on this, like we know the metadata in terms of like, where does everything start? Remember, there's going to be the anchor block and then you've got these I nodes and then there's obviously different ways of skinning the cat on this. What we're trying to do is remember the genesis of file systems It's to provide persistent storage on this, but we're also dealing with legacy mechanical hardware. So that's where a lot of these design decisions came in, in terms of, remember, we try to scatter the inodes throughout the disk in strategic locations. If at all possible, we're trying to minimize our movement on this in terms of, let's say, where do we store data on this? Well, we've got the data data, we've got the metadata, and how much metadata do we actually store? And there's other things, remember, Jeff, uh, I know he uh, talks about in terms of like, there's typically levels of inodes on this. So in other words, depending upon how big the file is, you know, if we have a really small file that's only 50 bytes, maybe just have one reference to it and done on this, as opposed to a really big file is probably going to have several layers to the tree on this and don't create them unless you actually have to have them. And then, and you know, I would say perhaps a good essay type question might be to compare and contrast something like the log file system with a standard Unix type file system. In other words, why have inodes in the first place as opposed to, remember Jeff's lecture in terms of with log file system, we're just going to kind of write everything sequentially and then we've got the trade off with the cleaning process and there's pros and cons on this. So it's not simply a discussion of one file system, but well, when, and, then, and then you might ask you, under what type of use scenarios would something like log file systems be better as opposed to, let's say, a more traditional file system involving inodes and, well, not logging. And when, when I say logging, let me be clear, we're not talking about journaling in the sense of safety on this. Everyone clear on that distinction of uh, logging for, in terms of the log file system as opposed to journaling, which is a type of logging on this. Right. In terms of when we're talking about like journaling, what we're talking about is essentially safety of the file system itself in the case of a power cut or other types of corruption on this. So, and then I think that should be about it. And then as Ali had mentioned, like, like the research papers too. And that's, I will, that's another thing. If you look at previous exams, I would say dollars to donuts, at least one of the essay questions is going to involve one of the published papers on this. And even something like the virtualization question last year, which you're thinking, well, wait a minute, we just talked about that in class as well. In order really to understand the third component to virtualization, which is the pair of virtualization, it was actually buried in the discussion about how can you virtualize on a smartphone? So that's actually where the discussion of pure virtualization took place. So I would say at, 
certainly at some level you want to make sure that you have a handle on the research papers that were, dis were discussed. I would say there's a better than even chance that something's going to show up from that, just knowing history on this. So, questions, comments? Absolutely nothing. Well, what we were going to plan to do is kind of wrap things up, kind of take a quick peek through last year's exam in terms of what you would have taken. Again, one year ago, essentially at this time, May 9th, but 2016 instead of 2017. And how could you actually approach this? Again, like we had mentioned from <coughs> the lecture that I had covered yesterday, it's the midterm. In other words, 10 multiple choice questions plus a bunch of short answer questions plus an essay, a 20-point essay, but Jeff's also going to throw on there two 25-point essays. Oh, oh, did I jump ahead on that? Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Exactly on this. So that's, yes, okay. So, and like I had mentioned, I don't think that time is going to be the issue like it was for the midterm. I would just encourage everyone here and everyone again in video land, please do take advantage of that extra time. I know you want to get out just kind of cut and run for the summer. But again, this is where the majority of the points can be garnered. And it is typically, and certainly for this year's midterm and previous year's classes, what separates the sheep from the goat, so to speak. That the essays, they require a little bit of thought and planning and spilling of ink too. So just don't rush into writing them and don't rush getting through them on that because again, that's where you'll typically see the greatest disparity in terms of scores. I would say in terms of where you can actually save time and effort, it's the, going to be the short answer questions. I would say, I don't know, Dolly, if you want to chime in on this, but the short answer questions, from my experience, people actually tend to write too much to the extent that people miss points on the short answer question, it really doesn't matter how much they write. If I can almost tell from t reading like the first sentence, sentence and a half or so, whether or not this person is going to get pretty much all credit or is halfway off the boat or is completely out to sea on this. So the short answer questions really may be a few sentences at most if you find yourself filling up a half a page, that really is too much on this. It's, it, that's something that you can save time and get through very quickly on this. So, okay. And then in terms of the essays though, again, that's something, it's not even so much the length, but the fact that you really do need to think through and plan what's going on. So, let's take a look at, okay, I'm pulling up the, uh, the final exam for last year. Oh, oh, sorry, okay. Yeah, I'm cutting, yeah. You want to? Yeah, yeah. sorry, right. I'm jumping in. Oh, so. so let's move into the final exam format. And this is based on last year's uh, uh, exam. Um, so you're going to have, again, uh, something similar to the midterm in addition to two uh, long answer questions. So the uh, total points going to be out of 100 points. Um, and you're going to have 10 multiple choice questions that um, uh, worth one point each and these are drawn directly from the second uh, half lecture slides and it should be easy so all this information you can find it from the first page of the last year final exam uh, so then you're gonna have six short answer questions uh, we will give you credit for the best four and uh, each one fourth uh, worth five points uh, for a total of 20 points and please answer them in four or five sentences. Uh, shouldn't take longer than that. Um, and uh, these are mostly uh, drawn from second half material, but not entirely. So uh, some, some of them could cover the first, uh, the midterm topics. Then you're gonna have one medium answer question. This is equivalent to the long answer question in the midterm. Uh, this is worth of 20 points and uh, it's drawn from the second half material and you should answer it uh, in a page or two. Um, and then you're gonna have two long answer questions that are really long. So each one worth 25 points for a total of uh, 50 points. Both of them are required. Uh, it's not like the midterm where you need to choose one. So uh, please answer both of them and they integrate material from the entire semester. Uh, 
and your answer should span to several pages, uh, two or more. Uh, so uh, 10 multiple choices, six uh, short answer questions, and then one medium answer question, and then two long answer questions. All are required. You're going to have three hours. You shouldn't have problems with the time, so uh, it's not like the midterm, 50 minutes. Um, so use your time wisely. Uh, as for tips, um, how should you prepare? Again, study the lecture slides, then link that to what you learned in your uh, programming assignments and the recitation material, then start solving previous exams. Um, once you do that, you should be uh, fine. Um, how to answer? Please write your answer clearly. If you want to maximize the number of points that you get, uh, make sure we do understand. We can read your handwriting and we can understand what you're answering. So uh, as much as much that we uh, better understand your answer, you can maximize the number of points that you will get. Um, so uh, draw figures, uh, diagrams, if they help, uh, be concise, um, and be organized. Uh, use bullets if needed. Um, how to allocate your time? Again, the points assigned to every question should tell you how much time you need. So um, long answer question, 25 points. So that means 25 minutes, around half an hour. Um, for long and for medium and long answer questions, uh, know what is being asked. Please read the question completely. Uh, when we graded the midterm, we saw that many students didn't really read the question. For example, the question that ask you for the kernel privileges for multiplexing memory. Many students didn't read that what we need is the special privileges that the kernel needs for memory multiplexing and not the general uh, kernel privileges. If also for the uh, long answer question that was asking about predicting the wait times, many students just like they uh, discuss some other wait times other than the one that were clearly asked in the question, that is when uh, um, a thread is put to the uh, waiting queue. So please read the answer two times at least, uh, read it completely, you do have time. Um, then start, uh, then start answering and link it to what you've learned throughout uh, the semester. So that should be all for me. So you can, if you have any tips, and you can start with the uh, final exam. It's last year's exam. So the 2016. Yep. And I'm just going to jump right into the short answer questions on this. Again, just a few minutes bang through the multiple choice. Just make sure that you haven't made a dumb mistake on those. And the other thing I can suggest too is you're going to have ample time probably to do all of the short answer questions on this. I know probably the majority of people did more than what was required on the midterm, but for the final, there really is no good reason for you not taking a whack at all of them. And then you will have enough time to go by back and with a clear head decide, well, which of these is actually going to be the ones that you want to submit for grading on this. Actually, you know what? We picked the highest. So that, that is correct. So you know what? You don't even have to select. So just write down something for all of them. It does not hurt you on this because I'm going to assume that time should not be an issue on this. So we begin with the first short answer question here, which is question number two. And we're talking about RAID here. And remember, recall that RAID level one, we've got an array here. And remember what RAID one is. That's the mirroring thing. We've got two disks that essentially are duplicating each other. And well, so obviously you want to make sure what's the difference between RAID 1, RAID 0, and these exotic things like RAID 5, RAID 6 on this. So we're going to start off with something like this. And it's not so much that Jeff wants you to regurgitate what it is, but, well, why is it that he dives a little bit deeper? Why is there an asynchronous performance to be expected from RAID 1? 
and thinking, hey, wait a minute, RAID 1 is not the one that we typically pick for performance. That is true, it's RAID 0 on here. But what he's looking for is, do you know the fact that RAID 1, we've got two disks that contain duplicate information here. So why can we expect to see a jump in read performance on this? Think about it like this. Since we have two completely duplicate copies of this, we can kind of mimic RAID 0 in terms of reading on this. In other words, read a block from one disk and a block from another disk kind of almost at the same time. We can also take advantage of the fact that we have two different disks with two different disk arms. So in terms of where that file is, we can kind of look ahead and see, well, maybe optimize it. So we've got, when it comes to reading, the best of both worlds. We have two complete copies, and we can kind of pick, well, interleave it to speed up the reading process. Obviously, that's not going to be the case in terms of writing. So that's why we see this performance disparity in terms of writing. So that kind of would be the sort of thing that we would expect for you to kind of put down for this. So questions, RAID, what that makes sense. OK, moving right along, question number three. And oh, look at that here, the performance hits paper that we talked about yesterday. In this case, it's showing up on a short answer question on here. And Jeff is asking, essentially, you know what, kind of list off a bunch of the hints, well, that we talked about either yesterday or, again, if you took a look through the paper, you can kind of pick beyond that. So what are some of the hints that we can actually talk about? Well, Jeff has some listed that are there, but again, you can go beyond that. What we're talking about, like, remember, separating the normal and the worst case on this. We spent a little bit of time discussing that yesterday. And then just beyond that, we also want Watch it, read the question here. It's one point per hit, and then he's also looking for one point per explanation on this. So in terms of we can get six points, kind of maxed out at five points on this, but you can keep going on this. So we might take an example of what is an example of, let's say, separating out normal and worst case on this. Talked about this from yesterday. I gave one specific vis-a-vis -vis assignment three. But again, feel free to create an example that you might. I'm talking about swapping. Uh, I, I'm sorry, like the TLB shoot down. Okay? And remember the fact that in many cases, most cases, you really don't have to do a TLB shoot down on this. So optimize your code pass that in most cases, you don't have to deal with that. And then separate out the worst case that that's going to just take some time. Okay? Plan to throw one away. And again, you could even say, how about an example of that? is, well, my original design for assignment three or what have you. But not to be cynical on this, what he's trying to say is don't worry about starting over completely over because very often you need to kind of let ideas percolate in your brain before you can come up with a workable idea on this. Brute force, do things well, complete in background, certainly background. That's not something that we talk, you had to do yourself in terms of programming, but let's say in a user operating system, you could spin off a worker thread. Or actually, you know what? If you were toying around with, let's say, kicking off a paging daemon, that's certainly an example of doing work in background to try to optimize what's going on. So any of these. The grading staff is going to be flexible as long as you stick to the design of the question on that. So if you're thinking like, well, wait a minute, how much flexibility do we give? Read the verbiage of the question on this. So as long as you're fulfilling that, you're good to go on this. So questions about this in terms of just essentially, I don't want to say it's a rote memorize, but it's, this is about as close as it gets to it. Just knock off a bunch of what the hints are and give an example of each. And again, that's the sort of thing really probably five or six sentences tops because example, I, I'm sorry, hint, example, hint, example, hint, example. Done. OK, question number four. Amdahl's law. Now, reading here, remember a discussion of Amdahl's law, essentially that what we're talking about is if you work on Im improving one part of a system, typically the overall performance is going to be limited by the rest of the system. Remember back to 341 on this. My strong suspicion is that the people who, because you can see most people did fairly well on this question, but the people who did not do well 
it's probably because, it's not because they didn't know Amdahl's law, but because, take a look at what the question is asking here. Just not asking you to state Amdahl's law, but a particular corollary to that. So this is one of these, and it's not so much that we're being picky, but just do read and make sure that you answer what the question is asking for here. So in this case here, Corollary was talking about that the longer you work on improving a particular subsystem, the essentially you're going to hit diminishing returns. The less result it's going to have in terms of improving systems performance on this. So that's what we'd be looking for. And then in terms of what we want to go beyond that is take a look at how this would guide you in the future. So you can say like, well, you know what, if let's say I'm really trying to tune the memory subsystem of my kernel, well, after a while, I need to kind of step back and see, is that still the biggest problem? And then maybe it is, in which case I need to keep working on it, but maybe not. Maybe I now need to because I've exposed something else as being my biggest problem. So again, this pr question here probably could be answered or knocked off in two or three sentences, if that. So you don't need to list like the, all the equations for this. You don't need to go into lots of deep examples. Those will be nice, but the, the grading staff is going to simply say, do you know what the corollary is? And essentially, how does that apply your tuning and development of a system? Done. Question number five. And, okay, looking at the grades for this, it looks like this was a tougher question on this. But again, you know what? You might as well take a crack at it because, well, we're going to pick the highest. Actually, the computer grading algorithm is going to scan over what the grades that were assigned, and it'll automatically pick whatever the highest scores are. But <coughs> question, okay, what's the difference between placing the buffer cache above the file system or below it? And if you recall, this was the subject of a couple specific lecture slides on this. So it's kind of specific, but you know, even if you, let's say you were completely hooky for that particular lesson and you just, or you just don't remember that slide and thinking, what were those, what were the pros and cons of that? You can probably reason this question out here. So in other words, where can we actually put the buffer cache here? So in other words, ab above the file system or below the file system, and what impact does that have here? Because, well, number one, what interface must the cache support at each level? And what's cached? And then, well, how does it kind of affect overall? So let's kind of take a look at these two things. Well, if we put the buffer cache above the file system, in effect, what are we intercepting? We're intercepting thing in terms of OS 161. Well, remember the file system was given to you. That was that whole VFS layer that everyone was haranguing you. Don't touch it. It works. It's a black box here. Well, you're intercepting calls down to this from typically, let's say, the process file system, like a syscall or something like that. So you're caching, in effect, let's say, opens, reads, writes, closes on this. So that's kind of what's going on in terms of the interface that we're dealing with. It's, it's well, a quasi syscall interface that is what we're kind of having to cache in, well, the buffer cache on this. Uh, as opposed to if we put the, file, uh, the buffer cache below the file system, well, what does the VFS layer call down to? Well, I talked about this in one recitation probably about two months or so ago. Remember, VFS layer calls down to like the inode layer and then eventually down to device drivers. Well, we're talking about accessing the hardware typically at the block level on this. So that's the, if you will, the interface that the buffer cache would be dealing with if we were putting it below the file system. We're talking about, let's say, dealing with it in terms of a block to be read or a block to be written on this. So there's pros and cons of that here. And what's going on in terms of, well, what do we want from this? We also need to know, OK, what's cached in each case? Is it, let's say, data in terms of files, or is it data in terms of blocks here? And how does that impact, well, how we do things on this? Well, again, there's pros and cons in terms of if we cache things at the file level, we can kind of get an idea about, well, what are the file access patterns? In other words, if this file X is read, 
we noticed from machine learning that file Y it tends to be read pretty soon after. So we might be able to do some, let's say, prefetching or what have you. So we can study these file access patterns. That's something we wouldn't be able to understand with blocks because blocks, really, we don't know what they represent. Because remember, file X could be stored in one location in a disk, but then maybe somewhere else later on. So that definitely would be an advantage to having the buffer cache above the file system. But remember, Jeff also talked about if you put the bu buffer cache below the file system, what are we catching? We're essentially catching all I.O. on this. And that's important because in terms of the data that gets returned at the file system level, it's essentially just that. It's data. We're not really intercepting or dealing with metadata. And that's something, if we put the uh, buffer cache below the file system, we're also going to be able to cache things like inodes and uh, other directories, or like bitmap or whatever it happens to be. We can cache that and speed that up too, which we would not be able to do if we had it above the file system. There's also another thing, kind of bonus points, if you noticed that putting the cache below the file system, you also don't have to worry about like consistency on this too. Because if, let's say, at the file level on this, the user may think that, you know what, I've, let's say, done a call to fsync, and I think that all the stuff is written out. Well, you know what, that may or may not be the case here. As opposed if we, let's say, put it below, we're actually going to have or be able to eliminate some of these potential consistency issues. So again, this is something my guess is it requires a little bit more thought. And that's probably why the scores on this particular thing were a little bit lower. It's also, it is a somewhat detailed question. It picks from a particular part of a lecture. But on the other hand, even if you didn't remember what those were, you can probably sit down and puzzle out and get a lot of points from this. Because, well, what is it? What, what is it that the file system expects? And what is it that the file system kind of needs from the lower levels? And I can probably at least take a pretty good guess at what it is that the graders are going to be looking for. Moving along. Question six. And actually, whoops, you know what? In the interest of time, so that unfortunately I don't have three hours here. I think I would bore you to tears if we did that today. Let's actually kind of skip ahead to maybe some of the, like the, well, take a look at, let's say, the mid, like the, the mid question, uh, question number eight, virtualization. <coughs> And here, essentially, what you're going to be asked is, let's take a look at the three types of virtualization that are out there. And well, obviously, you need to know what they are. But what we also want to know is, OK, what are the three types? How do they work? And like, what are the mechanics of making them work? What's virtualized? In other words, what's the interface that we're dealing with in terms of virtualization? And what are essentially the pros and cons? Again, in terms of this, it's stated like, what are the challenges to this virtualization approach? I can tell you when you take your exam next week, most of the essay questions are going to involve what are the pros of this approach and the cons of this approach as opposed to the pros and cons of this other approach. So if you haven't discussed the pros and cons of multiple approaches, you're probably missing something in your answer. It's just it's, again, it's the way these essay questions tend to be structured. So let's kind of take a look at these. First one, remember, full virtualization on this. And what are we essentially virtualizing? An entire operating system and at the hardware level. We're kind of providing, well, we're not kind of, we are providing virtualized hardware. We're faking out a guest operating system on this. So that's what's being virtualized. And in the mechanics, what we'd be looking for as a grading staff is obviously you've got a guest operating system. You have to have a host operating system. And you also need, remember this widget, this VMM, Virtual Machine Manager. That's the virtualization tool. So in other words, you've got a host operating system, then an application, the VMM. And then above that, we've got the guest operating system. So those are the parts to it. Now on, and we would expect you to discuss a little bit about how it actually works here. And well, we're saying, well, we're running the guest operating system as a program. Well, that's great, except what? What happens when we run programs that think that they're operating systems? You've got this problem with, remember, traps. Because 
user programs are going to be doing things like executing syscalls or referring to locations in memory. And that's great if you're a real operating system, but remember, I'm just a lowly program, the virtual machine manager, and I can't risk the guest operating system trapping because I'm not going to get it. It's going to go to the real operating system. So this is the big challenge with full operating, I'm sorry, full virtualization. And this is what you need to do to solve it. Remember, this was the whole thing that was a big discussion, yay, about 15 years ago. Essentially, you have to kind of keep reading ahead and sometimes pre, let's say, compiling or recompiling on the fly certain instructions so that the guest operating system doesn't trap. That's what makes this all work. So logically, we get the same result, but what's going on is the operating system, we're going to try to run as much code natively on the CPU, but some of it we're just not going to be able to do that. We're going to have to intercept calls on the fly. And again, this is one of the things we talked about yesterday, kind of just-in-time compi uh, compiling. Well, this is the very real use for that in terms of inserting stability into full virtualization. Now, that's going to make it slow. But on the other hand, the nice thing is it works for all operating systems, and it's a great drag-and-drop resource for legacy systems. So that, in a nutshell, is full virtualization. And frankly, we would probably want you to mention all of that. The fact that it's full virtualization, the three components. The big challenge is we have to intercept traps. And we do that by recompiling on the fly. The benefit is we can essentially virtualize everything. And I know I, as a grader, as a matter of fact, I did grade this. That is what I would be looking for in order to ladle out the full credit for the full virtualization on this. As opposed to, let's look at the next one, paravirtualization on this. Well, this also involves a guest operating system and a VMM, although it's typically called a hypervisor, but kind of the same function here. There's no host operating system, though. So that's, again, it's one of these, that's one of those, you just need to remember that. Don't mention it because points get lost that way. And the genius behind paravirtualization and the subject of research on this too is remember the problem with full virtualization is it's slow we're constantly having to read ahead and compile and interpret this well remember this is the old software paradigm of dynamic versus static on this instead of having to do dynamic translation on the fly let's do it statically let's kind of take a look at the guest operating system, where the problem children are in the guest operating system, and in effect change things ahead of time. That's why it runs a lot faster. Now, the fly in the ointment with this is we have to make these changes ahead of time, which means we need essentially cooperation with the guest operating system. In the case of something like Unix, that's great, or I should say Linux, it's open source. In the case of Windows, that means you're going to need the support of Microsoft because they've got their source code in a lockbox. But again, it can be made to work, and it is made to work. So the, I would expect you to mention the parts in terms of guest operating system, a virtual machine manager. Again, there is no host operating system. We would expect you to talk a little bit about the pros and cons. It's going to run a lot faster. As a result, it's great for running server farms on this. Uh, con is it does require cooperation from the operating system uh, designers on this. Yeah. And kind of brownie points, if you talked about the Zen people who got this actually working, they took advantage of the fact that, let's say, the Intel chips have multiple levels of privilege. So you can actually run the hypervisor at the really highest level of privilege. And then you've got the hypervisor and uh, the, um, the guest operating systems at a middle level of privilege, and then the user programs at the lowest level of privilege. So that was kind of like a nice genius insight that they took advantage of. And then the last part, the container virtualization, again, the source for that was the research paper that talked about phones and how can you run multiple uh, guest operating systems on a phone. And here, what are the parts? We've got a host operating system, but we don't have a hypervisor or a VMM per se. What we have is provisions within the host operating system to virtualize the namespace hence containers on this. So we have, let's say, each pseudo operating system. All we're really doing is we're peeling off various levels that, let's say, I can have a copy of Microsoft Windows running in this instance. 
and well, actually not. Let's say its process ID is X, but I'm running the same program in another guest container, and its process ID is Y on this. So I have to virtualize things like process IDs, file handles, namespaces on this. The upside to that is that what gets virtualized is at a much higher level on this. You know, I'm not running an entire guest operating system. I'm only running one host operating system and a whole bunch of guest containers on top of that. So the downside is I have to have support for this from the operating system. I also am limited. I have, can only run one type of operating system. For example, like with full virtualization, I can virtualize Linux next to Windows next to perhaps even a, a gray market copy of OS X all on the same machine. As opposed to container virtualization, if I'm running Linux, I can only have a whole bunch of Linux containers of the exact same type. Plus side to that is since it is lightweight, I can, it's going to be great for resource constrained devices like a phone on this. So again, that's what we'd be kind of looking for for these three levels of virtualization on this and what are kind of some of the pros and cons. <clears throat> so questions, comments about this? Okay. And again, that was a discussion of the 20 point question for the others. Take a look at it. It's essentially, I would say the only big thing, I'll just mention this very briefly, like something like the heterogeneous cores thing, that's a case of, Jeff is talking about if you've got two chips, okay, I'm sorry, two cores, a big core and a little core, and how does it impact the various systems? You can see right away, you're gonna to have to discuss how it impacts virtual memory, how it impacts CPU architecture, how it impacts threading and processes. So it's cutting a wide swath across different topics and that's what he'd expect you to discuss. And the same thing is true in terms of the last question on this, in terms of let's say that we had a whole bunch of memory in the future, rather than a simple hard drive and dynamic memory, we're just gonna give you a terabyte of flash memory. And how does that change your system design on this? Again, it's gonna impact files, it's gonna impact processes, it's gonna impact virtual memory, and we would wanna see a discussion of this. Make sense? Okay, we'll stick around as long as there's any questions, but good luck, people. Thanks for taking OS 421.521. Yep, our pleasure.